boom, 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 baby. Happy Saturday to you. Hope you are having a great Saturday. And as usual, hope you are having an awesome weekend as well. My name is Don Terrell, and I want to welcome you to another great episode of The Color of Motion. Where I like to say, stories come in all shades. And I highlight people of color in diverse backgrounds in the industry of motion graphics, animation, visual effects, cartoons, comics, um, and just this industry that I love so, 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 so much. Um, uh, you know the drill. Jump in, say hello, where you're tuning in from, so I can give you the shout out that you so deserve. You know, I love to hear from my viewers, you know, and uh, like I said, give you a shout out as well. Make sure that you uh, jump on over to the Facebook group community, get engaged, uh, become part of the family, facebook.com slash groups slash the color of motion we're having a lot of fun over there having great engagement and i definitely don't want you to miss out on all that's going on over there um you can also like i said connect with me on um uh, like i said all the uh social platforms but uh you can find me here connect with me follow me i definitely want to hear from you i'm getting pretty good at this Connect me, connect with me, follow me on all my platforms there. I definitely want to hear from you. Let me know what you're uh, thinking of the show. Like I said, a lot of big things have been happening with the show. A lot of big things planned. And uh, like I said, I definitely want to hear back from you. Like I said, we stream every Saturday afternoon live. It's 3 p.m. Central Time uh, to YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook. And now you can check out uh, the, you know, broadcast on the website. You know, we got the new website up. You can uh, check out uh, what's going on over there and uh, watch the broadcast. Let me uh, throw this up here. Like I said, you can check it out. The new website is up. As you see, we are streaming live to the website. So I definitely, uh, you know, want to uh, get some good engagement over there as well. Check out some of the uh, guests that we've had on the show. You can check out their episode or you can hop on over to the channel. Check out the channel. Check out a ton of other guests that we've had on as well. Always giving a big shout out to our sponsors. We've got some, you know, great sponsors on the show. Looking to get uh, even more sponsors. Definitely, if you're looking to be a sponsor, you can download the media kit. Get in touch with me and love to have you support the show and the channel and everything that's going on. Like I said, you can reach me here um and let me hear from you but like i said i'm super excited that uh you know the new site is up definitely adding things to it so uh again hop on over there check it out uh because like i said i definitely want to make it better uh for sure uh as always i always encourage people to hop on over to the youtube channel subscribe hit the bell notification Give a thumbs up, comment on the episodes as well, and you can check out all the past episodes that we've had so far, all the great guests that we've had on as well. So hop on over to youtube.com slash Don Terrell and check out, you know, the color of motion and all the other great content, you know, I plan on putting up on, uh, you know, the show. Like I said, uh, we've got uh, some great get or great guests, but we're uh, always working to, like I said, get uh, you know more sponsors on the show. Definitely want to give a shout out to today's sponsor, uh, DG Graphics. Uh, we do they do all the graphics, the images, the overlays, animations, um, and they make this live stream show look great. You know, so if you're a business or a brand looking to level up your brand design or looking to start a live stream show, 
definitely reach out to them uh, because they can help you look good for sure. So thank you to you graphics for sponsoring the show as always. Um, like I said, we've gotten some big sponsors um, backing the show, and that's always always makes me feel good. Like I said, when people get by, companies get behind the show. So always looking to, you know, just get even more sponsors for the show and definitely looking to, uh, you know, grow it for sure. What else? <clears throat> what else? Uh, like I said, uh, we got a lot of big things happening with the channel. Uh, I always like to show the back end. This is how, you know, I put the, the show together. You can see the whole little crazy little setup here. Uh, for sure, but uh, looking to, you know, take it up to a new level uh, for the remainder of the year. It's hard to believe, you know, coming up on uh, the season. I started the show in November of 20, it's 2022, 2020, you know, right in the middle of a pandemic. And uh, November is kind of the anniversary date, even though, like I said, the new season starts at the beginning of the year in January, but November's coming up quick, and so I'm trying to plan another little anniversary show uh, to celebrate our two-year anniversary uh, for sure. So super excited about that as well. But you know, I've been enjoying doing the show, enjoying uh, having the guests and friends that I've had on, and definitely working to uh, you know make even bigger ones also like i said um, you know we're working to get sponsors but if you're uh wanting to support the channel support the show definitely hey i love a great cup of coffee buy me a cup of coffee at buy me a coffee down to slash don terrell you know you can donate whatever you choose but that definitely helps to uh continue to level up the show and create great content so any little bit helps for sure and definitely there there's a membership uh five dollars a month or fifty dollars for the year uh, i put up private content there that uh, the members can check out um, even looking to put up more uh, maybe some swag items and other things so it's been uh, fun, and like I said, we got a lot of big things planned for the show. So super excited to be diving into this episode. Uh, a little bit different guest, still in the same vein, but uh, super, super talented uh, designer as well. So I'm looking forward to having her on the show. So without further ado, let's dive into this. Uh, my next guest was born here in Houston. So she was born here, Houston, but grew up in Lagos, Nigeria, where most of her identity was formed. She always drew and painted and was in art class and was obsessed with storytelling and computers. When she started thinking about a career path, she wanted to find something that was going to allow her to blend everything that she loves because she wasn't going to be working at a job she didn't like. And I can definitely relate to that. You don't want to work at a job that you don't like. She knew she was going to be an artist full time and at all times. And she got to know about 3D animation and visual effects from an interview she watched of Saison. I mean, I hope I'm not <laughs> slashing up his name, but Saison Ogunru, Ogunru, Ogunro. Sorry. Sorry, Saison. Ogunro, who is a music video director from Lagos, Nigeria as well. She went to look it up, and for the first time, she was exposed to computer arts. She studied 3D animation and visual effects, and prior to her, her graduation, she decided to do design uh, as a career. She helped create 700 2D illustrations that focuses on eradicating toxic norms within the Afro culture and promoting unconventional career paths using Nigeria as a focus. And they are building a metaverse of Lagos. We're gonna dive into that too. Metaverse is becoming really huge, which will be available for virtual commerce and interactive experiences. Everybody, please help me welcome my very special guest and friend, 
Daniela Uchendu Ozi. Well, hello, 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 Daniela. How are you? Good, how are you? I am great. I am great. Been so looking forward to this interview for sure since we first connected. Um, really enjoyed your work when I came across it. You see such great design work. Um, so invocative um, that I knew immediately that I had to have you on. Uh, for sure, and to, to talk about your work and your journey in the industry. Yeah, I appreciate that. That introduction was beautiful, actually. <laughs> it was amazing. <laughs> well, we try to make our guests and friends the stars that they are, for sure. Again, everybody, like I said, I, I, this is always, I always say this is an interactive broadcast, so I definitely want you to hop in and say hello to Daniela and just engage with the show as well. Um, but let's dive dive right into it, uh, Daniela. When you were, you were born here in Houston, but you grew up in Lagos. And how old were you when you moved uh, to Lagos? I was still very, very young. I mean, I would say what one year old or two oh, years. Okay. okay. But my dad used to work at the American Embassy, and you know how they they usually would transfer people over to different places. So um, it was America, and then back uh, to Nigeria. So I grew up in Lagos, which is me. So I'm Lagos. Lagos is me. Uh, and that's pretty much where most of my identity was formed. I didn't know so so. I mean, I. All I knew about America was that I was born here. Um, so it was something that I always had at the back of my mind. And depending on the situation, I knew I was either going to come back here for university or just come back um, here, period, just depending on the, the, the way everything panned out. But yeah, Lagos was, was it. Okay. So uh, <laughs> how were you when you came back to the United States? I was 17 going on 18. So okay. um, I finished college that same year. So I finished, um, sorry, high school that same year. I finished high school, Sacred Heart College in Apapa in Lagos, a boarding school. Um, I finished that same year. That was 2016. And once I was done, I just came back, uh, came down here. Um, and I went to Drexel University where I studied uh, 3D animation and visual effects. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So, um, like I said, your like you said, your identity uh, was in Lagos. Um, for you, and now that you've been over here a while, what's been kind? Of, I mean, the differences, obviously, that you kind of you know picked up on um, industry wise and just work wise. I mean, do you think you would probably be um, doing what you're doing, or maybe as successful as you are? If you had stayed over in Lagos or? I don't know. I think, so as a character trait, I think being ambitious is a character trait that I've always had. Um, so regardless of where I was, that character trait was always going to be there. And yeah. I would always push for things as much as I do now. Um, but I do think that being here exposed me to certain things um, that being in Nigeria didn't expose me to. Um, when I found out about computer arts, which was 3D animation, when I found out about it, it was by, um, I was watching a, a, an interview of Shesan Ogunro. Shesan Ogunro is a music video director in Lagos. And at that point, I had already decided I was gonna do software, uh, software engineering, because it was computer. Um, but the, I was trying to run away from math and physics because that was. <laughs> I did the same thing. The science industry wasn't my, my forte. Um, I used to really, really, really fail biology <laughs> in high school. Um, it was terrible. So it wasn't something. <laughs> so when I mentioned <laughs> that I wanted to study software, my mom was like, Are you sure where you come in? Yeah, I was but, the same way. <laughs> But to me, it was just computers and, and computers was something that we grew up around because my parents at a certain point, they were running a business where they were making websites for people. So UI mm -hmm. UX design was something that was so we we were computer people in our house. Um, so 
I knew there was drawing and painting, there was storytelling, and there was computers. So whatever I was going to do in that, in that, in those things, that's probably what um, I was going to do. Um, and another thing that I was very interested in was law. I don't talk about this a lot. <laughs> Law was something I was very interested in because I think that I am a troublemaker by default. <laughs> Whenever we, should, I, <laughs> we should definitely figure out how to com, com, combine the two if you're still interested in law. You know, law for designers or, you know, law, you know, that type of thing. Yeah, so if, it, if, I, if there was anything that was connected to, like, injustice that I thought um, was, that was where that whole law niche would always, like, hit. Um, so that was pretty much my journey of figuring out. So that interview, they asked him what he studied in school and he said he studied 3d animation and, uh, special effects. That's what he said. Digital effects. Um, okay. Yeah. I heard of it. He then said that he studied that, um, when he was abroad, but he decided that he was going to do music video career wise. And then he just became like a music video director. Um, there was somebody, there was him and Meji Alabi. There were two people that I used to love and they used to make music videos. At a certain point, I was interested in like film, music videos, all of that stuff. Um, and they, uh, but I went, I ran to the computer and looked it up, looked at, and I saw that there was something such as computer arts. And the only other time that I was introduced to 3D animation was when I was in high school. I had this one computer teacher. His name was Mr. Edwards. He's dead now. Uh, may so rest in peace. But he had shown me Blender for the very mm. first time. Yeah. Um, and I didn't, I thought it was very complicated. I wasn't even interested because that was like, Blender was coming out for the first time as a software and it was just, I was like, horrid. Yeah. yeah, it was a horrid uh, 3D it, software. Yeah. It was terrible at that. I think this was 2012 or so, something like that. Um, and then I used to sneak to the computer room even at points when we weren't allowed to be there, um, just to go look at that software again. Um, but while they're introducing me to, to, to like Blender, he also introduced me to like Photoshop and Illustrator. So, and there was Coral Draw yeah. at that point too, which does not, I don't use that anymore, but if anybody does, God bless you. Um, <laughs> but, uh, so it was those three that I was, I was, and then I started to enjoy, um, enjoy it. And I saw that, oh, you could actually draw for a living, but how visible was it to do that in Nigeria as, as a career? Yeah. Um, and that was like the bigger, the bigger question, but finding a school where you could even do 3d animation was another issue. Cause I know that my parents didn't want me to come here at the age that I did. They wanted me to come in for my master's as opposed to 17 coming for undergrad. Um, because now you're coming to a whole other country. You don't like literally have anybody. Um, it, most times when you think you have people, you really don't. Oh, yeah. You're, you're a nuclear family of the people. And America is a little bit different. America is more, and Nigeria is more family oriented. So if you fall, it's easier for somebody to catch you. But yeah. here, you kind of have to stand up on your own. Um, cause everybody's now very, very individualistic. So yeah. Yeah. It's it, hard to find. I mean, here, yeah. unless you're, unless, like I say, your family is that type of family, but, mm -hmm. you know, unless you have somebody here, it's, yeah. you know, I can't imagine, you know, being in another country and being by myself and then having to adjust, you know, yeah. just, like I said, nobody really immediately to fall on. Um, and I kind of noticed this um, from some of the other, you know, uh, creators that I've had on from, especially Africa, that they're having to go abroad to get, whether it's England or France or over here, they're having to go abroad to get, you know, really specialized in good education. Um, mm -hmm. Do you feel like that's one change? Well, like I said, I don't know if you're, you're, I'm assuming your mother and father are still over there. Are they still over there? My mom is here now. Um, but my dad and my siblings, they're in Nigeria, but they're going to be moving soon. Okay. And mm -hmm. I'm guessing it's changing, you know, gradually. But like I said, I found that that was a big thing. There aren't a lot of, you know, schools there that are providing that type of, you know, in-depth, in you know, education. I'm assuming it's going to change. It's changing gradually, but. 
I think the, the the issue is I think it depends on the industry where you want to go, like school, because the schools are great. Yeah. If you hear like the education to here, um, the schools are like phenomenal. There's no way you would go to school there and not be super super intelligent because yeah. the things that they're honing on are like super uh, really good. So if you're going to study engineering or right, going right. to be some type of a doctor, those things that they consider to be conventional or the money, where yeah. the money, they're going to put all the effort into those people more than others. Yeah. Um, so if you're saying that you want to study arts. <laughs> yeah, as far as the arts and say, and like I say, you know, the guests that I have on, that's the industry that they're going into, arts, animation, that type of thing, you know. Yeah. There wasn't a school at the time I was checking. Um, there wasn't a university that had 3D animation and visual effects. Yeah. And I told, as I told my parents, 3D animation and visual effects, they were looking for 3D animation and visual effects. <laughs> they didn't know anything else. They were just like, 3D animation. She said 3D animation and visual effects. She said 3D animation, that's it. So they're looking for 3D animation. Uh, but 3D animation is not available. And there's like corners. There's I know mass communication is one that's super, super popular. Yeah. And then there are academies um, that have film academies. But there's no university yeah. that for creative careers. Yeah. Uh, I personally think it's a very, very, very big problem. Because yeah. I think that in Nigeria, most people are creatives. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I don't know if it's a thing of the culture or if what it is, but most people are creatives, but they end up doing something else because they're either afraid of following what they actually really want to do, or they're actually, they're afraid of using their, their gifts more so because it's not, everybody comes to your face in high school and they would tell us in art class, you will be Paul. <laughs> we kind of get that here i mean you know a lot of you know they think it's like i said that a star being artist kind of thing um uh -huh. and like i said they always want you to at least if you're gonna follow art have some kind of background or backup plan education that you can fall back on just in case the art thing doesn't work yeah. Um, but I think that's starting to change. And I would hope, like I said, um, you know, there, and I've met a lot of people over in uh, uh, Africa, different parts of Africa, um, and had a lot of guests and met a lot of friends. And it, like I said, I know the talent that's over there, um, creative-wise. Um, but I would hope it's, it, and I would guess it's going to start to change because there are a lot of, animation studios that i see cropping up now and especially you know studios that companies over here such as disney and sony and warner are starting to go over and partner with to get different content you know that we're used to seeing over here so i would hope that you know as far as education in the creative space that that you know and you you know schools that that would really start to change i know it's kind of you know, a little bit easier with online, you know, you can jump online and get learning, you know, so you're not so much limited to having to come over here per se. Um, if you didn't, if you really couldn't, or just wanted to start learning stuff, you know, you have access to the internet, which helps a whole lot for sure. But there's, there's also a lot of other like little support that you can get um, one thing that I know that I did was always look for mentors. Yeah. So whenever I did that, there are things that they wouldn't teach you in school that you can learn from, from people who have been in the industry. Cause most things you learn the hard way by being in the yeah. situation. I know with me, because I, I went to 3d animation school. So that's what I specialized in, which was storytelling, animation, visual effects. Um, but when I decided I was going to do 2D design, um, that graphics and motion graphics as a career, one of the biggest issues that I had was like the principles and the basics of design. I was doing it as an artist and I wasn't really noticing the little, little principles of things like grids and yeah. making sure things align in different ways. So those things are very by the time you get into the industry and you're working for, for somebody, they begin to notice those things and those things now become like a, 
it's 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 a thing that can set you back yeah um, because you didn't traditionally go to like design school and those are the things that if if i were to go back um even if we don't even necessarily need to go back because i think that everything is coming together now where people could have access but more so create a platform that would allow um people to have or more so glo black global diaspora and to have that access yeah. and build that ecosystem where we can get that access um because what happens is the access allows you to to learn things that you wouldn't learn in school yeah. um, questions that you probably are afraid to ask your professor you can ask somebody else that you feel comfortable with um, and they could tell you that, oh, even though they started working at a company like Adidas, it didn't work out. And this was why it didn't work out. And then you have an edge up. So if you get to the place where you're working at Adidas, you know, okay, my, whatever I, whatever deficiencies I have, he also told me his, so I know what to work on before I get there. So now you don't have to learn the hard way as he did. Um, and that's the essence of having people go before you. Because if people go before you and they don't teach you, yeah. you have more people stumbling as opposed to just um having more people if somebody stumbles we try to make sure that the next person doesn't doesn't stumble yeah um, yeah for sure and i know um um maybe and maybe like i said you can give your thoughts on it i know over here um like i said they think create, you know, they're, they're kind of, you know, the government, there's a lot of programs, a lot of schooling. So we're a lot more creatively over here uh, as far as just, you know, government funding and, and government kind of putting programs and schools really kind of cropping up. Do you think that's another thing that, and I know in certain areas, like maybe in S South Africa, you know, they have, you know, like, um, what is it? Um, tax incentives for businesses, for schools and things like that. Do you think that's going to need to be a, a lot more broader in reach in different areas of Africa? The government kind of putting tax incentives behind that, the creative space. Like you said, they have, I'm pretty sure they probably already do it with, like I say, engineering and more of the technical, you know, schooling learning, but in a creative space. Mm -hmm. I like to say that usually the mindset is what we need to fix first. Because once you fix the mindset, it's in Africa as a whole. One thing is because we are so strict and stoic in the way that we see life, the way we see things is very traditional. So people don't always step out of the box of tradition or step out of the box of religion. And they don't, they don't, when you step out of that box, you begin to see different things. Um, if you're think the thinking traditionally is that if you're it doesn't make any logical sense to go do art if you're not going to make money from it <laughs> because the things that our parents do to get us to go to school i've seen parents sell their cars i've seen so they put in so much effort yeah. so there's no way you're going to come back without any money <laughs> you have to come back with money to take care of your family um and that's that's the mindset but Nobody sees that until Afrobeats became this big. Yeah. Parents would not tell you to go sing. If you're singing, they'll tell you, why are you singing? <laughs> why are you talking to each other? <laughs> so it's, it's, it's more so, um, it, what happens is you kind of have to prove yourself as a creative. Mm -hmm. And creatives as a whole have to prove yourself to the governments in mm -hmm. African countries that you could do certain things. Yeah. Before you are seen as serious and i think it's it's gonna it's gonna change there are yeah. people i hope one i hope if they allow me to be one of the people to change it i would change it because i have a lot <laughs> i have a, a feeling lot. you are like i said there's a lot and i think like i said i've connected and met so many creative people over there like i said i know and it's and it's interesting because you know when i talk to them they watch you know, American cartoons. So they see how powerful, how big an industry it is. Uh, and I don't know, like you said, you know, mm -hmm. the culture over there maybe just doesn't see it. Over mm -hmm. here, like I said, I, even though, you know, most parents 
and can't really see, you know, people making lots of money doing it. It is big money, in, in, you know, in the industry. I don't, usually I wouldn't separate black people, even though I feel like we're, we're just different people. We're, we're raised in different places. So we have yeah. and different experiences of blackness. But I think that underground, we're all kind of the same. Yeah. Because our parents, the way my parents would, could tell me, what are you, cartoon? <laughs> what is funny cartoon? That's the same way another black parent from another country is yeah. going to be like, why do you want to study cartoons? I don't understand why you want to study cartoons. Because cartoons are seen as a thing that is 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 um, for kids to watch. Yeah. And it's thing that, that, so that's the level that it's seen. Yeah. But they don't know that there's somebody, nobody ever thinks like, who makes these cartoons? Yeah, and yeah. And it's funny because everybody says that at some point, like, I didn't know people actually did this for a living, you know, and it's like, yeah. somebody's got to do it. Yeah, somebody's got to do it. And, and it's the same thing with gamers. Yeah. Once upon a time, people would see people sitting down playing video games as lazy, but if you see, there there are people who play video games who make money from playing video games. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it, I mean, you go on, you go on face, and it amazes me too. I've seen some people just are on Facebook live playing a video game, and they've got like hundreds of people tuned in just watching them play the video game. You know, how about how about we get to the point where we tell at least black black children that are growing up if gaming is something that you're interested in get to a place where you teach them how to develop the game yeah and you also get to a place where you teach them how they could get access to the people who are actually making money millions yeah yeah for playing games that way they're doing something that they love and they're not going to work every day annoyed yeah yeah <laughs> morning is like why am i waking up what am i doing <laughs> but i think like you said the, the good thing is with the internet you you know have some access even if you're not able to to get over there so as far as like like you said i think it starts with hey you know if you like video games you know there are people that make the video games. There are companies that make video games. So if you're, it's just like if you're going to be, I guess, a, a, you know, cause, you know, I say be a con, uh, creator before a consumer. So, you know, if you're a creator, there's, there's somebody that's creating it. So if you love something, think about, you know, being on that side of the, of, of creating it because you're going to make way more money than if somebody just buying a game and stuff. And, I think with, like you said, the access of not only training, YouTube, you know, other courses, you got a lot of software out there now that's available. Like you were mentioning earlier, Blender. I'm going, I'm teaching myself Blender now. So, and it's free. So you got a lot of access to great software that, you know, can get into these hands of these creators that, you know, will give them, start to give them access. And like you said, expand their knowledge of what they see or have seen in this box. Mr. Downtown, I appreciate you as always. I think that even here in the U.S., there are some families that feel the same way about making a living in art. And I, we were just talking about that, Demille. Like I said, my mom was the same way. I mean, she, she saw the talent that I had, but she couldn't wrap her head around, you know, just, can you make a living doing this? I mean, is this something that you can make a living doing this. And I think that goes from way back to that starving artist type mm -hmm. of, you know, mentality. So I think now the younger generation and, and newer creators are understanding mm -hmm. the the money and the power in creating their own content now and really getting it out there, which is great to see. Yeah, Grant, it's a harder path to follow than everything else. You know, yeah. there's the there's something that people would say there's a difference between working hard and working smart. Yeah. So before you jump into something, it's usually better for you to get information and then figure out what kind of person that you are first before you get into that, that kind of situation. Because if I'm going into that situation, cause I'm very stubborn and if I want to do something, that's what I'm going to do. 
um, and I make sure that I see it through. There are people who don't have that same type of mental powers yeah. that end up then becoming starving artists. But you yeah. can't use those people as uh, as examples for the rest of us because there's people who know that this is what they want to do. And the drive that most artists have is more so, I want to prove to you that this is a thing that could be done. Yeah. And that, that's the drive that most artists have. Um, and then from that, from that drive, you then create a brand and you then push yourself to, to the place where you, you, you're, you're supposed to get, get to. Yeah. So. And I think, like you said, the true artist that is really passionate about it is going to see it through, you know, yeah. regardless, they just got to do it and they're going to, you know, do it no matter what. And the truly mm -hmm. successful ones are the ones that sacrifice the time, the effort, you know, to get better at their craft, you know, regardless of what everybody else is doing around them, you know. Uh, Sleepy Gallows Studio, appreciate you tuning in. I agree for sure. Um, for you, um, when you went to animation and VFX, you know, school, what was the big learning thing that you kind of took away from, from attending? So I started at Drexel, but I didn't finish at Drexel. I transferred. There was a lot of other things that happened. Um, my my college years were very, it was a struggle period for me um, overall, life and school period. Because yeah. um, it was a lot of adjusting to America. And then there was a lot of adjusting and changing softwares and learning. So the, that period was, was funny for me. But when I got there, what I discovered, what will happen is you begin to discover, okay, this is what you do well, and this is what you don't do well. And then when you get to that point, you then begin to begin to like form exactly what part of it you wanted to do. There was this one exercise that they did when I was at Drexel, where they had somebody come talk to us. And then he put in like, a, it was like a, a little bag, he had the different career paths in animation that you could be yeah. Um, and they had the VFX producer, they had, they had illustrator, pretty much computer arts. They had a uh, compositor, they had, um, some rigor, they had 3D, 3D environmental artists. So that, that kind of opened my mind to actually understanding that, okay, in this, and when we're doing the, our final projects, they would usually split everybody. So yeah. you don't, you don't, you're not doing exactly the same thing you did in your first year where you're creating the environment and creating the models. They have people, one person is creating an environment, one person is rigging, one person yeah. is modeling. Um, so because of that, you then begin to figure out, okay, at a certain point, you do want to hone into yeah, what, what you enjoy and what you enjoy doing well. Um, when I, my first year in um, college, I didn't do well at all. Um, in 3D animation, I was failing really bad. I was even on academic probation. Um, one would say it was probably adjusting to the mm -hmm. country that caused that. Some other person could say, I probably didn't know what I was doing or maybe I was making a mistake. And some people would say, she's dumb. <laughs> Regardless of what it was. What do you think it was? What do you, what do you think it was? I, 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 don't, I don't even know what it was. I think, I think at that point, there was a lot of things that was, that was going on with me personally that I couldn't like put my hands on. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the end of it all, I mean, I'm doing it. You know yeah. what I mean? It's like now, whatever anybody said at that point about my situation, yeah. didn't matter. Because now I'm now doing from all of that and with all of those failures, I've now gotten to the place. And in future, I'm going to get more and more successful having in mind that those were the struggles that i had yeah um, and learning from those struggles that, that 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 i had so whatever anybody thought at that point didn't really matter yeah um, but one thing that i did that i think that i i um did well was whenever i didn't do or if i got a d in a class for instance i always went back to that professor to go figure out what it was yeah and to learn and I think that's what is helping me now because that humility to go ask people for help, a lot of people do not have. Yeah. And if you don't have that, you're not you're you're not gonna learn. Yeah. And I mean, even even the professionals, they do it mm -hmm. at studios. They if there's something that they're working on that 
the director or producer doesn't say is working right, they ask, okay, what can I do to make this scene better? What can I do to make this animation better? I mean, you have to in order to get your skills better. How can I make this better? Um, and I ask myself the same question, even with this show. How can I make this show better? Um, so definitely keeping yourself open to, like I said, improving your skills because it's a never-ending journey um, and asking people for help for sure um, definitely goes a long way. So you, did, you real, did you figure out then that, uh, well, you know, while I like animation and visual effects, that wasn't kind of the, the path that you wanted to go down? Um, per se, because like you said, I think as you go through it and you see all these different avenues that you can go down, you know, with animation, visual effects, whatever it is, there's just so many. Like I said, I enjoy rigging, but I don't think I could do it day. I don't think I would enjoy doing it day in and day out. You know, um, what did you figure out as far as that? I, I didn't. In that moment, until I graduated, I still was thinking 3D animation and visual effects. Um, that's what I was thinking, but I wasn't sure exactly what I wanted to do. And I graduated college during the pandemic. So that was where, I think during the pandemic was when I figured out, because even though people think that COVID did bad for people, I think that COVID put all of us in our feelings and we went to the bed and we were like, what am I doing? <laughs> I always say that's the best thing that came out of COVID. It gave people this opportunity to really reevaluate what it was I really wanted to do with my life and the path I wanted to go down. Pure isolation. You're just like, Jesus, help me. <laughs> so that, that, that was what happened to me. And even though since I was 14, I've always wondered, what am I doing? Um, since I was 14, I've always wondered, what am I doing? So I still had that question, always thinking, oh, what am I doing? And I still am think, always going to have that question, even when I'm 40, just because of the, the character trait. But I decided to do design during COVID. Um, and that was... I was learning so much. I had figured, oh, animation takes a long time. So even this, do I want to work in, in the film industry doing animation? Do I want to work in cartoons? Will I see myself working in Disney or those kind of things? And that was when I finally then decided that, okay, I probably don't, I want to do this as something that, um, if I could do it freelance, but I don't want to work day in and day out doing, doing it. Um, so I decided, okay, I have 3D animation as a skill. I keep that. That's a skill that I have. Modeling is a skill. Animation is a skill that I have. Um, I also do illustration. That's a skill that I have. And then blended all of those things, graphic design, motion design, blended all of those things into one and then said, okay, this is a brand that I would create for myself. And I, with this brand, I would make something um, and start doing design this way. So that was kind of the path that I went on um, with figuring out where what I wanted to do career-wise. Got you, got you. Um, what are the type of, you know, uh, animations and things that really kind of speak to you? And we're going to take a look at some of her work. Like I said, she's gotten a lot more into design work and really ex expressive. I'm not sure what you would call it maybe i mean what would you call it really um expressive design work that really highlights um causes and themes uh that she talks about what would you you know um kind of how would you kind of describe you know your your style your work and what you enjoy i would say offbeats um the reason I use that word is because I consider myself to be offbeat. So if the world is going left, I'm, I want to be going right. <laughs> That's kind of how I am with my stubbornness. Um, so I, I tried to, what I, I, I tried to do was, even if I wasn't traditionally doing 3D animation, I wanted to do something that would, where people see my work, they know this person has a background in 3D. Because um, I wanted to do something that was traditionally out of the box from like design which is why i didn't go full on into branding branding um because if you see i'm not, i don't make logos yeah i make 
from posters and, and, and key arts and, and things like that. Um, that oh, she, Daniela froze up. I know we were having issues with her camera. Daniela, let me throw up the chat here. Uh, hopefully she can uh, see that. Oh, you're back. Okay, you froze up there. Yeah. So hopefully your camera hangs hangs on through the interview here. <laughs> We're having technical issues with uh, Danielle's camera, as you can see. But go ahead and finish what you were saying there, Danielle. So it's more so just trying to to design something that was a little bit different than the regular design that you would see every day. Um, so that was that. That's pretty much it, how I would describe it. It's a little bit abstract, a little bit off beats. Um, just trying to break the traditional design norms while trying to stay within that those design principles. Yeah, yeah. And we're like I said, we're going to take a look at uh, Daniel's work in a second here. Um, but uh, as far as uh, the type of stuff that you watched growing up, um, especially over in Lagos, what did what did you kind of consume as far as, you know, the animations and content that you were watching? I watched a lot of cartoons, Lion King, there was um, the Pinky and the Brain, <laughs> Mickey Mouse. <laughs> I remember Pinky and the Brain. Uh, Prince of Egypt. Uh, I, I watched a lot of cartoons. Ben 10. Um, yeah. I, I was an avid uh very very into the cartoon network space um and uh yeah i mean nickelodeon i used to love boomerang a lot because i used to always like the the older cartoons can possible yeah. one of them yeah. i have to try to see if i can find it today on youtube yeah uh, there's, there's so those those type of cartoons were things that i used to watch a lot of uh um, uh so things uh, like Little Mermaid, uh, Princess and the Frog, I used to like them because I'm a very lovey-dovey person. So <laughs> I'm about fairy tales. <laughs> so what, I mean, okay, so from your perspective watching it and the perspective of, you know, growing up over in Nigeria, what did you think of the, I mean, even though you watched it, what were your thoughts um, on the content that was coming out that per se had, you know, black characters in it or lack thereof black characters? What were your thoughts thinking about that over in Nigeria? I think I did have, I mean, I did have an opinion about Lion King. Um, I had an opinion about Lion King being more so animals as characters. That was one. Mm. Uh, and the language, even though it was something that was supposed to be centered in Africa, wasn't directly directed to South Africa. There was no, there was no animation that was bringing in West Africa. Mm -hmm. It was also South Africa. So it, South Africa became like a central place for Africa. Yeah. And the languages that they wanted to speak. So if they're talking Africa in like a, a Disney movie or something like that, they're talking Africa. I'm hearing Swahili. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so... Interesting. I'm part of it. Why is Igbo not part of this? Why is they, they have people in Angola? Why are their languages not part of this? Why yeah. are Kenya which is not part of this? Um, it, so that was something that I know that at the back of my mind I was always thinking about. Yeah. yeah. And another thing that used to make me very worried about TV was whenever they wanted to show Africa on TV, they would always go show the, the children with the illnesses and the yeah, forest, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the flies. Yeah. And um, it, yeah, it, I think it, it, like I said, it gives this, it paints this picture that we see or we think of uh, over here uh, for sure, which is you know definitely far from what you know Africa you know has to offer everywhere in Africa, and that's the funny thing too. I've talked to some <laughs> some creators that I've and friends that I've had on the show, and they say the same thing. You know, Africa isn't just lions and tigers running around like, you know, you know, there's so much more to it than that, you know. Yeah, so it's, it's more so centered uh, uh, animals. Um, I know the Princess and the Frog was, uh, no, it wasn't Princess and the Frog. I think it was the one that the cartoon that was based in Louisiana. Oh, yeah, 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 that was, was it? Uh, yeah, Princess that was and Princess the and the Frog, I think. Yeah, yeah. it was based in yeah. Louisiana, New Orleans, yeah. Yeah, I think the princess was black. Yeah. And that her yeah. parents was black. Um, they, I don't know if I'm 
saying this correctly, but I think I was probably the only black uh, princess that existed. Yeah, I think so far, uh, yeah, if I'm not mistaken. And, yeah. and viewers, if I'm wrong, I don't think there is, there may have, there may have been to that point, but I don't think there is. I don't know. Pocahontas was black too, but she was more so, I mean, she was more so Native American. Yeah. Um, yeah. She was black. Um, I don't know if there's been any black princes um, in any Disney movies. I don't know if no. I've seen it. Um, so what yeah. if you're, well, in fast forward, what what was your kind of thinking and take on like Black Panther? I mean, I know it's, you know, you know, really a big gap in between, like I said, I think the fact that, you know, there was a black director and he really, you know, black characters and actors and production people and writers really made a difference. But from, you know, somebody living over in Africa, what was your opinion when you saw, you know, a movie like Black Panther? I loved Black Panther. And and the reason is because I saw the effort that went into gathering all of those, those um, languages and bringing all of those cultures you would see that in, in Black Panther, there was no, even though there's 54 countries in the African continent, he highlighted as many of those cultures as possible. Yeah. So I'm not going to highlight all of them because in Nigeria alone, there's over 200 la- languages. I don't yeah. know how people are going to be in a movie. <laughs> but um, it's, it's highlighted as many as possible and highlighted as many languages as possible and then included actors um, that had those languages as backgrounds as well in in, in that. Um, and when I watched the, there was an interview that I watched, I think it was an uh, You're muted, you're muted there. I'm sorry, I, I, I picked this, uh, redid this channel. Um, can you unmute yourself? Can you hear me, Daniela? Um, check to see if you're, um, I got you unmuted in the sound levels for some reason. I don't know why it's showing up muted. Okay. Say something, say something. Ah, why is it showing up? Well, let me jump back to this scene. I don't know. I was trying to create a new scene. Um, and for some reason it was, and it's still coming up muted. Other muted in sound levels. Why is it coming up muted? Oh, let me publish this. Why is it? Will unmute, unmute guest one. Why is it coming up muted? Oh my gosh. Hey, baby. Technical difficulties you always have here. I'm not sure why it's muted over live it shouldn't be it should not be muted let me jump to another scene here uh back to live no publish okay let me we can hear you now uh, okay. let, me, let me jump to this here real quick. I want to see something. Excuse me, everybody. Where is it's tough, like switching around. Say something, Daniela. Hello. Yes, we can hear. Ah, oh, man. I so I was trying to fix this scene here because for some reason okay. it switched over. So I kept it on both of us while I was creating this new scene. Okay. Ah. And as always, it's technical difficulties there, um, but we are back, and uh, I got it now. Uh, let's throw up some some comments while we're doing this. Uh, downtown the meal without failure, you can't appreciate the f- sweet feeling of success uh, yeah. for sure. Um, and I think, like I said, that's that's the main thing. You gotta, you know, stick stick to your guns because there's always going to be people that just don't get what you enjoy doing and yeah. you know what you're good at doing sleepy gallows i stayed on the cartoon yeah. network yeah cartoon network was good i was a big warner fan not much of a did even though i watched disney 
but I was more a Warner Brothers kind of fan myself. Uh, she is Keita from Atlantis is debatable. <laughs> debatable but see i think the gripe with me and i wouldn't even say it's a gripe because i get it you know the thing with me which they're changing now um is they created the few create the few characters they did make of color they still look white they just slapped on a color to me and they did that with toys they did that with everything you know, they created these things like, okay, we need to give them something of color. Let's just take the the dial and color it, put some color on it. So yeah. now they're more conscious of, you know, the feature. Now that they're more creators and people are really more conscious of diversity and the, and the real nuances within diversity and, you know, creators of color, you're starting to see those features that are, you know, indicative of that race that they're trying to, you know, um, put as a character. So that was the thing that kind of stuck with me, you know. Uh, Mr. Raul, I appreciate you tuning in. Brother, positive vibration for sure. My Jamaican brother, for sure. Um, and we're going to take, like I said, we are going to take a, a look at some of uh, Daniela's design work, like I said, she focuses now more on you know two D um, you know design and motion graphics. Um, so for you, branding kind of wasn't that lane that you kind of wanted to go down. No, that wasn't. Mm -mm. <laughs> I, that wasn't. I mean, I, I'm not a. I knew from the beginning that that wasn't something that I liked to do. Um, I could make logos, I could come up with logos, but that's not my favorite thing to do. So gotcha. I kind of just went away from it gotcha. um, and started doing everything else aside from that. Gotcha, gotcha. And like I said, she does um, some amazing work and we're gonna take uh, a little look at it and talk about, like I said, your style and how you approach uh, a lot of your design work. When you're sitting down, um, getting ready to work on a project, what is kind of your thinking? Um, and I know it depends on the campaign that you're working on and the piece that you're working on. Um, but when you start to sit down, do you start from a certain point? Um, usually when I get an idea, the first thing I do is either write it down or sketch it. Um, and sometimes if I could get an idea from looking at Pinterest or get an idea from looking somewhere and take a screenshot, keep it somewhere. Um, and then that, that's usually the starting point of, of most of the designs. Um, so if, if I do get um, maybe a client that comes to me with a specific idea, with the ACLU, I did a competition that they were, uh, was it a competition? It wasn't more, more so a competition, but they just needed graphic designers to design um for one of the their campaigns and yeah. i did a design on um i did something related to black wall streets um and that was and that one was something that oh i got the idea i woke up put it together in the sketchbook and, and then did the design and they were like they liked it and can i do another campaign for them um with something similar yeah. to that so from that idea i created the rest of them well, you seem to enjoy doing social messages. Is that something that kind of, I mean, developed in you really early on? And, and what was it that really kind of sparked the need to create graphics that speak to social issues and social changes? Like I was saying that I was super, super interested in law and injustice and, and things that are related to, to stuff like social causes and, and stuff like that. So that's something that I've always loved um, I wouldn't say that I'm a political person, but I wouldn't be surprised if one day I wake up and decided to go. <laughs> but I don't think I'm going to do that. Uh, so I think this is just more so my way of passing the messages that I want to pass. Um, and especially for something that is related to something that I feel deeply, um, it, the design will usually always come out better yeah. um, if it's a social cause that I'm very, very passionate about. Awesome, awesome. Like I said, do some phenomenal work um, and just, like I said, in your collage of images and words that really speak 
to, like I said, just social issues. And even, you know, some of the other pieces, like the MTV piece and the DD piece, are just so graphically um, visual um, that they definitely catch your eye. Um, what do you, I mean, looking kind of in the future for you, what is kind of like, a, you know, a, a dream project or kind of your next stepping stone of where you want to go to? I think personally, uh, with my design journey, I think I want to end up being being able to use this creativity in some way, maybe be a creative director or, or art director. Um, but I do want to be a designer first and grow in that, that experience before I, I do get there. And then there's other things that I, I do want to do. Um, I want to be part of the people who create an ecosystem for Black people. Yeah. Um, I have that. I have, there is the NFT project that we're working on. That yeah. is one avenue. Yeah, I was just getting ready to ask you about that as well. Um, tell us, uh, before I dive into a few questions about that, Kind of give us a, a broad stroke of, of what you're doing uh, with the NFT project. So the NFTs, um, I looked at NFTs, but it wasn't something that I was thinking of getting into right right um, at that time. But one of my friends had introduced me to a guy, his name is Chris Obia. He was big on NFTs and he wanted to do that, but he didn't have like a designer and artist to work with to make NFTs. Um, so somebody had connected us and initially it was like a bigger team of people. Um, we decided we we're going to do 700 2D characters. Um, and these characters will stand for people who are doing unconventional things or following unconventional parts. Um, anything that's considered out of the norm yeah. um, and people who are breaking toxic norms. Um, for instance, um, women in some of these Muslim cultures who they probably ship them off to get married at 13, 14, yeah. but she wants to go to school and she decides to do that instead. Um, so we have a character with a woman who is like uh, with a hijab, who has a space suit on because she wanted to be an astronaut. So based off of all of those characters, we each of them have a story um of standing out in some way or breaking the toxic norm in in their various communities so we just kind of created different characters some male some female yeah. and we put those characters dress them up in a way um so the there's a subculture in lagos that's called ote and ote is alternative um now it's being pushed in Afrobeats and also with fashion because the idea of ote is um, Ote is saying it with the accent, Ote, um, but the full thing is pretty much alternative. So those are people, it's like the subculture that they're trying to use to break those toxic norms within the, the culture. And that's um, things like they would say, if you have dreads, you're a thug. Um, so they're using fashion and they have people wearing dreads, dreads now who are doctors just yeah. to tell, tell that story. Um, and they have um, different things. So if society says one thing, they want to say something else and have have it be different. If you say a woman should go get married at 12 and she says she wants to have a career, then get married, that's how it's going to happen because they're, they're using that little subculture to to um, tell this story. And even though it's a Gen Z thing because we're, we're very stubborn people and we're trying to break everything that has already been created. <laughs> But I think that this one is something that is necessary yeah. um, because what it does is that it frees people's mindsets. There are people that are using it in the wrong way to yeah. do that are not necessarily supposed to be used for, but it is, that's, that's one culture that I definitely stood. I feel like most people were doing that under an umbrella in Nigeria and in different places. Um, before today, but now it actually has like an umbrella where people can stand on and say, okay, this is what I am. This is what I'm doing. Yeah. Um, so we created that, that um, the NFTs out of that specific culture. Yeah. Um, so that that's pretty much it. And then we're creating the metaverse. So that one is actually like the product that's coming out of, of it. Yeah. The NFTs are pretty much more, more like the currency that we're using um, the metaverse is going to be the product because the way we see it is more like having that be like a like a hub for business and social. It's going to be a hub for business. It's going to be an educational hub. So yeah. in there we built like schools, 
So there's going to be one school where people are going to be able to learn like cloud architecture, different creative careers um, are going to be taught in there too. And have people, maybe an animator, come teach animation for like three weeks or something like that. Yeah. Um, they're going, there's going to be like, a, there's a bank. It's, it's more so like a bank, a little bank that we're partnering with. Um, I think they're called like Cloud Vest. Yeah. Um, they're going to help people with like credits and all of that stuff. It's going to be in there too. There's going to be a mall. Um, in there, we tried to get like different people in the mall. So maybe, for instance, the way Subway has their their store, if we're able to get them into that space and have them come have Subway in the mall, yeah. um, get people like little like shop stores, maybe if possible, get Nike and Adidas people that sell shoes, have them in there. Um, so the, the place is like a hub where people could do their business and have that, that, that be an existing space. Cause Lagos is a business hub of Africa. Yeah. So if we have it where, where like a simulation of Lagos, where people who have lived in Lagos say, Oh, I know this street. I know this. <laughs> yeah. <street."> yeah. <laughs> and have it just be that space where people can get in there and feel familiar with it. Yeah. I'm, I'm still trying to wrap my head completely around the metaverse but you know and it's still new and everything but like i said the potential of what it can do and how it can bring people together is intriguing to me and hopefully have somebody on i uh, met a couple of people um and actually black that are really into the meta metaverse um having them come on and talk about that as well but you know it's an intriguing you know idea of how you can really, like I said, bring, you know, people together from different parts to make this um, ecosystem, economy system, and basically, you know, uh, uh, you know, economy where people can buy things, shop, you know, go around, learn um, different things as well. How do you feel, you know, for you, how, you know, design and, and creative, you know, supports that kind of and meshes with that kind of social change and, and just knowledge in general. I mean, for you is, you know, how do you see the, the synergy in what design and animation and creation can do as far as bridging that gap? I think that if artists haven't spoken, if artists haven't spoken, nothing moves. And, and, and the reason I say that is because I feel like we are the people who have the loudest voice. So if in music, a lot of people listen to music. So if we have music where somebody is passing a certain message to do their music, you know that a lot of people hear that. Yeah. Um, it's a, a thing with designers. If we have different designers that are passing a specific message and they're probably popular and have like a lot of fans and people looking at their stuff, people are definitely going to be looking. Because even though Art is something that people have put underground a little bit. People are still watching artists. Yeah. So it's very important for artists to always speak. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's, I think as an artist and creatives, they're, we're, we're trendsetters. We're the ones that really kind of set trends and get things going, whether it is fashion, music, art, or, or whatever. Um, it's usually where it starts to, to grow as well. Um, to this point, what's been kind of the best piece of advice that somebody's given you that, you know, it's kind of stuck with you and serves you well? Um, this was my mentor. His name is Mario. He said, he said, he said to me, no matter like where you get to or what company you work for, make sure that you never forget to, um, make sure you never forget to continue to invest in yourself as a brand and as a designer that be by learning um doing anything just don't forget yourself in another person's project awesome awesome piece of advice and as always i like to drop you know the bomb on knowledge <laughs> on knowledge that is always dropped Again, we're having a fun conversation with my friend Daniela here. Uh, please jump into the, the conversation as well. Uh, viewers, we definitely want to hear from you uh, for sure. Um, what it, is, is that the advice um, that you would share with an upcoming artist or somebody just you know, 
thinking about it as well? Definitely. It, definitely. I mean, it, you have to always push yourself to a place where you feel comfortable within what you're doing. Because what happens to a lot, of, and I think this was back probably for the past three, four months. Um, usually I would design almost every day and post on LinkedIn. But yeah. if you had to, I haven't been doing that lately. And that's because you get to a certain point where that something might happen, there might be a shift in your life where that creativity is gone and you're not even feeling like doing any of that because now you're feeling like, okay, maybe this thing that I'm doing is not producing this results. Yeah. So very, very important to, for you to continue to feed yourself as a designer and then get to a place where you are comfortable because people have to always hear you speak because you're a designer. Um, I feel like we're, we're the ones that, that are pretty much telling, saying things as it is yeah. um, in the different ways that we, we can. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're going to use our brand a lot of the times to, to push messages and then push certain things. So it's always better, in my opinion, to, to get experience, learn from that experience, and then don't forget yourself with anybody else's projects. <laughs> yeah. and not everybody i'm not saying everybody's going to come up with a project to do yeah. i'm just saying, even if the project is more so working on yourself as a designer or working on the specific or trying to figure out what design skill um that you you could learn that could be the project but yeah. just don't forget to start with somebody else's project awesome for sure for sure mr debil you know it the bomb always comes on knowledge <laughs> you gotta drop the bomb on knowledge so what are some of the things outside of the art that you do um that you do to help fuel your art because I, like i said you have to have you know just these other creative endeavors or just things that you do in order to keep yourself like i said engaged creative whatever it is um fueled do I do anything? I think everything I do is within the arts because I know music is one thing that I, I, didn't, I don't know if there's very much that I do outside of the arts. Um, I know music is one thing that I list. I do listen to a lot. Most of my everything for me comes from listening to music. I'm an avid music listener. Yeah, avid music um, listener. Um, I also do watch a lot of movies. Um, podcasts is something that I, I listen to a lot as well. And I also always try to find people who, who uh, speak wisdom yeah. and subscribe to them on YouTube. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Another another bomb drop. I'm not going to drop the bomb, oh, Neil, but yeah. another bomb drop. Um, and I'm a, I'm a big believer, like I said, in, in self-development, developing, constantly working on developing yourself, whether it's reading, podcasts, um, uh-huh outside of art, inside of art, philosophy, whatever it may be, but always kind of developing uh, yourself for sure. Um, again, uh, as uh, we, like I said, kind of wrap up this uh, fun conversation that we've been having with Daniela, uh, definitely uh, hope that uh, all of you have enjoyed the conversation because I know I have and definitely looking forward to uh having uh, Daniela back on the show for sure. Um, definitely, if you are, uh, you know, smart enough to do it and smart enough to think about it, make sure you connect with uh, Daniela on all her channels here where you can find her. Definitely reach out to her on LinkedIn. That's where I connect with. That's where I connect with everybody. Um, Instagram, see more of her work. Um, her website, uh, for sure. Check out the Web3 project that uh, she was working on. Um, you definitely will enjoy that uh, as well. No, I forgot the dot in www. I'll make sure I say that. Um, but all this information will be on uh, the show notes on the YouTube channel. Again, make sure that you reach out to Daniela, connect with her. Um, Daniela, we're going to have to get together for coffee since we're here in Houston. Oh, yeah. yeah, for sure. And, uh, connect. Um, but definitely, like I said, uh, so appreciate having you on the show. Um, and it's always a blast. Like I said, you just have this energy that you just, you know, you love getting connected with as well. Um, 
as a final thing, um, if you could go back to, you know, you're relatively young. Or, oops, sorry. Wrong scene. Sorry. If uh, you're and you're relatively young, but you're, you know, <clears throat> really younger self, what would you tell yourself? I mean, what was well? I'll, I'll scratch that for you. What was the biggest adjustment coming back to the states? I mean, just emotionally, was it being alone coming to the states, or what was the biggest adjustment for you? It was difficult because even so, coming from another um, coming from another state, I you begin to understand. I don't know whether to call myself an immigrant because I was born here, but yeah, I think, you're, no, you're yeah. not an immigrant because you were born here. But you grew up over, like I said, yeah. in Nigeria. So coming back over here, it is difficult because I, I had the experience of an immigrant, um, and the only thing that I had was my passport, and that's like the only thing that made made life easy um for me at that point but if i didn't have that it would have been a much much different experience and um that that immigrant experience wasn't the fun it wasn't fun mm -hmm. um it wasn't fun for a lot of reasons and, and that's because from accent and just adjustments to your by yourself and your your immediate family and especially if you're growing up in a place where um family is something that is like Pretty much so that we come to a place it's very individualistic. So that adjustment was a was a very, very difficult adjustment. But um we're we're here now. <laughs> and yeah, yeah. Uh, So was English the major language that you you know you grew up with and was raised with, you know, with your father, yeah. especially with your father being ambassador or uh, you know, uh working embassy. Working yeah. for the embassy. Mm -hmm. English is English is the 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 language in in Nigeria, Lagos, Nigeria. Period. English is is the primary language that we all speak. We have over two hundred languages. So if you speak anything other than English, I don't know if many people. <laughs> you do, you be, speak, do you speak anything other than English or? Igbo. Igbo is my tribal language. So Igbo uh -huh. is is my my language, um, and that's my tribe. Yeah. And, within the Igbo tribe, there's different types of Igbo. Okay. So it's, it's kind of like broken. And then there's people, there's Yoruba, there's Hausa, those are the popular ones. And then the smaller ones, and there's Essek, there's Tiv. So if you're living in a central place like Lagos, you don't know. You have to kind of speak. There's Pidgin English. Pidgin English is another thing that most of us know how to speak. Because it's not English, but it's 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 broken English, just like you guys have Ebonics. Yeah. Um, but it, it's... Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah you kind of have to have like a central language and yeah. Yeah, we were we were colonized anyway so english is not my mother tongue but we yeah, yeah 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 um but for you okay so just uh what was the language again Igbo. Igbo. say just you know say say something in Igbo in like like, thank you. We're glad to be on the show, or this was a great experience. That means, that means by people. <laughs> oh, my goodness. But see, I think it's, I think it, that is an amazing thing to be able to speak. Because, like I said, over here, very, I won't say very few, but it's not like something that's, you know, required most blacks speak English. Most Black Americans speak English, so unless their parents or family is from another country, or unless they're learning another language, it's not mm -hmm. like something that is, you know, you know, spoken. Say like uh, Spanish is. Most Spanish kids are kind of bilingual because their parents or their grandparents probably speak Spanish, and they're probably learning English in school. Yeah. I have a friend like that. I'm trying to learn Spanish now. Um, but I have a friend like that. He can speak English. He can speak Spanish. He can understand both. So I think that is a big thing to be able to speak other languages. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there there is some African countries. You know, they had like the Anglophone, Francophone, and then they had the Port Portuguese speaking countries, yeah. and that was so from how we were colonized. So there is Cameroonians are, are pretty much like they can speak English, and some of them they can speak French, and then their languages. So they they have three. 
um, languages that they could speak with us is just to you speak, except if you learn, they teach you French in school, just like they do to Spanish here. Um, but it's, if you don't take it seriously, I didn't take it seriously. So no, yeah. yeah. And it's, like I said, it's, it's amazing because somebody else was saying the same thing. I think it was about, um, I think it was about Nigeria or it might've been another location. There's over 20 different languages in that country you know it's just even within that small country there's still a lot of different language spoken you know oh, yeah. between different ones mr garen a happy saturday to you brother i appreciate you stopping by for sure definitely uh for the ones that are come johnny come lately you're always able to go to the youtube channel and check out the episode for sure um and uh you know like i said have fun with us. Like I said, uh, we always broadcast each and every week. I definitely appreciate all the viewers that show up and show out for sure. Being loyal fans of the show, you definitely help make it what it is, along with the very special guests and friends that I have on the show. Like I said, make sure that you check out the episode here that we had and the fun conversation that we had with uh uh, Daniela, go check out her work. You'll be able to, again, see all the links over in the show notes once the episode is up. So make sure you reach out, say hey, connect with her, um, and check out more of her work. Um, Daniela, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to be on the show. Um, definitely looking forward to having you back on the show for sure. Um, and if you could... Um, hang out in the green room for a minute while I close out the show. Uh, but thank you, thank you so much. And like I said, we're going to have to meet for coffee um, since we're here in the same city, uh, for sure. Uh, but thank you so much for, for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me. For thank sure. you guys for watching. All right. Everybody, please, uh, like I said, help me thank my very special guest and friend, uh, Daniela Uche OG. I hope I pronounced that right. I'm really bad with it. Did I? Okay. Uchi. Uchi. O U G. O G. I appreciate that for sure. Um, hang out for just a second uh, while I close out the show. But thank you, thank you so, so, so much. Hey, uh, like I said, this has been a fun episode. They all are. I, like I said, I have so much fun doing these episodes and shows. I have so much fun meeting all the different creatives. I think that's, that's got to be the best part of the show is meeting all these different creatives from all over the world um, doing great things. Like I said, uh, Daniela's here, but she's, uh, you know, from Lagos. So, I mean, there's just creators everywhere, and their story and their journey is always a different one, which is, like I said, the best part of doing the show, uh, for sure. Again, I can't uh, thank you enough, the viewers, for always tuning in, um, showing up, showing out, and really supporting the show and the channel. Like I said, I do want to hear from you, so make sure that you do reach out, get connected into the communities, because I got to hear from you to, like I said, constantly make the show the best that I can make it. And you letting me know how I can do that definitely helps uh, a long, long way for sure. Uh, thank you, thank you so much for, uh, you know, stopping by and tuning in. Make sure that you uh, tune in next week because it's going. we're going to have another fun show for sure. You're going to get two for one. Allison Schillingford and Jay Bird Lathan, oral historian and script writer and an animator and designer doing some great things with uh, telling, using animation to tell a lot of historical stories out there. So looking forward to sitting down with them and having fun with my new friends there as well. So don't forget to tune in. It's going to be a great episode. Uh, again, make sure that you have a great rest of the weekend and a great week as well. Um, with that, you know, I got to close it out um, and appreciate you. I can't say enough. 
appreciate you for for always tuning in to uh, the show. With that, we're going to call this show a wrap for sure. I will see you same bat time, same bat channel next week. Everybody have a great one. See you next week. Cheers.